Hey, it's Mike Hambright. Welcome back for another Flip Nerd VIP show. Today I have with me an awesome guest. His name is Luke Cohn, and he uh, just recently turned 30 years old and quit his job. His day job was working for uh, Mercedes-Benz dealer as a technical advisor. And uh, at 25, he set a five-year goal to be able to quit his job through real estate investing, and he's done just that. It's a really interesting story, and we look forward to hearing more about it shortly. Before we get started, let's take a second to recognize our featured sponsors. RealtyMogul.com is an online marketplace for real estate investing, connecting borrowers and capital from accredited and institutional investors. Get a rehab loan fast and close in as little as 10 days. Rates start as low as 9%. We'd also like to thank National Real Estate Insurance Group, the nation's leading provider of insurance to the residential real estate investor market. From individual properties to large-scale investors, National Real Estate Insurance Group is ready to serve you. Please note, the views and opinions expressed by the individuals in this program do not necessarily reflect those of FlipNerd.com or any of its partners, advertisers, or affiliates. Please consult professionals before making any investment or tax decisions, as real estate investing can be risky. Hey, Luke. Thanks for being on the show. Hi, right, Mike. Thanks for having me. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm, I'm excited to have you on. Uh, Patty Robertson, who was a guest on the show a while back and a good friend of mine, said... Uh, that you need to talk to Luke because he's got a great story to share. It's funny, you know, I have a lot of big name people and really successful folks on the show, and um, everybody started out at a place where it sounds like you've just reached, and that is um, with a goal of being able to leave their day job behind and focus on enjoying their life more and having some financial freedom. So I'm excited to uh, share your story with everybody. Oh, I'm glad you had all the big names on here. Let's talk with the little people now. <laughs> no, no, no. And I, don't, and I don't mean it that way. I just mean that there's a lot of folks uh, that watch the show that really don't know where to get started. And a lot of the things that some of us that are more, I guess, veterans talk about are maybe a little bit higher out of reach. Like, how do I get to, how do I get to a point to where I do that or whatever? And so um, you've got the blueprint, I guess. So yeah. no, why don't I you just tell us a little that- bit about yourself? I just say that because I was actually really surprised when Patty mentioned it and you asked for me, you know, I have no idea or think that I'm in any position to do this, but the whole setting, yeah. setting and getting to where I'm at and, you know, it felt great to walk away from my job. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's something that everybody I see. And even when I started, um, you may have some other goals, but I'd, I'd say 95% of the people that, that look to get into investing is for some sign of financial freedom and financial security to be able, whatever that is, to be able to do that. So, yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I thought was awesome, cause I'm a huge believer in goals, setting goals. It's hard to accomplish anything if you don't know what you're setting out to do. And uh, when I heard you say those words before we started the show that I set a goal when I was 25, that by the time I was 30, um, this is what was going to happen. Uh, I thought that was that was music to my ears. So talk a little bit about, you know, where you were at the age of 25 and, and you just turned 30, right? In the past couple months? Yep, exactly. In okay. February. Okay. So, so talk a little bit about, you know, why you set those goals and, you know, if you had experience with real estate before that and, and how you saw real estate as a vehicle to help you accomplish what your goals were. Okay. Um, I'll back up a little bit before that. I liked how you're, you're also yeah. very goal oriented. So um, anybody that is or anybody that wants to be successful needs to be. I even started in high school where I decided that I was going to join the military, I was going to join the Army, then I, I decided I was also going to be a technician and work for Mercedes. So I picked the, the, the branch I was going to join, the unit I was going to join. Um, actually, all my paperwork was done when I was 15, even though I couldn't join until I was 17. Wow. Uh, I knew the recruiter. So I picked the school I wanted to go to. I was into that a year ahead of time. Um, I set the goal that I wanted to get a 4.0 in perfect attendance so I could get into Mercedes-Benz. And I wanted a perfect, you know, I'd, once I got in, I'm as close to perfect getting into whichever dealership I wanted my first choice. So I did that. I um, originally from Minnesota, joined the Army, went to Chicago. Uh, did Mercedes Benz school, got in 4.0, perfect attendance, got the first dealership of my choice, which actually ended me up in Virginia Beach. So right before that, I, did, I had a two-year break where I, um, I spent an 18-month tour with 12 months in Iraq in southern Baghdad. So 
that was a huge, I had just finished technical school and had a two year gap and then was supposed to go into one of the most elite automotive programs that there was with everybody coming out fresh 4.0 perfect attendance. You know, I wasn't the only one. So yeah, I was really worried about that, but I did great second in my class, got my dealership of choice interviewed, had interviews all over the country. Um, came here and the, the whole time I was traveling through school and in the, in the back of my head, I, I had this itch for real estate. Like, even though this is what I wanted to do, I, I didn't want to do it all day long, every day, forever. Right. And so when I was going to school, I contacted my dad and I said, Hey, when I'm traveling around for school in the army and all this, I've seen a lot of houses here. Why don't I buy some and fix them up and live in them? And then when I move on, we can rent them out. We'll build some rentals. And I got the typical parent, you know, that's a terrible idea. We're never yeah. doing that. You're going to lose money. So I just went back <laughs> to it. I went back to it, moved out to Virginia Beach, started my job. And within the first year of being here, I heard one of those infomercials on the radio for a, for a seminar. You know, I'd been reading some books and I hear a seminar yeah. coming to town. So it's the classic, you know, got fired up, went to a seminar, you know, ended up buying some programs and doing some classes and then just hit the ground running right you know i spent yeah. money to do it so i wanted to recoup the money and i did my first my first mobile home deal is what i started with i did that right during the class so did you did you so, start that i want to know did you did you start investing was this before you said i'm 25 and i'm gonna do accomplish this by 30 or did you do a few deals and then say hey this this is a path to achieve what i want to achieve this this all came about right in uh when i moved i moved here in 2007 um Right in that 2008 mark, right yeah. around 25 is when I started looking at real estate with yeah. all the reading I was doing and the classes I was taking. Okay. And as I started looking at what my goals were as far as did I want to make some cash right now, did I want to build some cash flow, you know, I, I had a pretty good job with Mercedes Benz, so I was looking at building cash flow and that developed into my goal of, well, ideally the, the goal is to build enough cash flow to replace my job. Right. So, so how long do I think that will take and, and what dollar amount do I need? And it was really easy to just say, well, I, I need to make approximately what I'm making at work. And then at, at some point, if I walk away without taking any hit in income or being able to keep your expenses down and being able to cover your bills. So at that point, I figured five years was a, was a pretty good mark where I, I better be able to figure out what I'm doing in five years and I better have done something in yeah. five years. And at the same time, that would put me right at my 30th birthday. Yep. So from, from the beginning, that was always in the back of, that was always my goal was my 30th birthday, just be able to walk away. And as I was approaching it, um, you know, I did, I deal primarily in mobile homes. I've done a lot with that. As I was approaching it, nothing's ever perfect. You know, yeah. financials aren't perfect. You know, I was looking at the aspect of being able to get more loans. You know, obviously, if you have a regular W-2 job, you're, you look better to the banks. Right. Um, but one thing I did is I told everybody my goals. So when I came to turn in 30, it was like, well, it's not perfect, but I've told all my friends and family what I'm going to do. Yeah. So now in, inside, you know, I could have stayed at work and nobody would have cared. But right. in, inside, I was really like. I have to do it now. I told yeah, everybody gonna I was going to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that you say that. I, I tell people, uh, people that I mentor and coach, I go through. We go through a, a goal planning exercise. We have, you know, some sh sheets that we fill out and some online tools to help plan. I usually use. I came from the corporate world, so I usually share a kind of an inside joke. But the company that I worked for, and I think a lot of big companies are like this, is anytime somebody there's a lot of people throwing around ideas and calendars and things like that. But uh, whenever it got laminated. That was like, okay, that's the law of the land now. And so I tell people, you know, set your goals, share them with your friends and your family, your spouse, your partner, whoever, because it's going to hold you accountable, effectively, you know, laminate it by sharing it with everybody. And it forces, it really kind of forces you to either maybe look silly or for people to know that, you know, you achieved what you set out to do, right? Yeah, it, it definitely holds you accountable. Um, yeah. I did it as far as with my beard. I just grew my beard a couple months ago, and everybody asked me. I said, "That's my that's my fitness beard. I can't cut my beard until I get back to where I want to be, you know, with my fitness goals." Yeah. So, so everybody that can be big on about. goals, man. It's funny. I, I'm reading. Uh, I just finished reading a book called The One Thing, and it basically teaches you, to, you know, to focus on doing one thing really well. And uh, what they talk about in there, and I can't remember exactly what they call it, but it's 
it's a you set a long term goal, let's say a five year goal, and then say, well, what do I need to have accomplished? What can I do right now to accomplish? You know, basically, uh, what do I need to accomplish in one year to make sure that I hit that five year goal? And then what do I need to do this month to make sure I hit that one year goal? And what do I need to do today effectively to make sure that I hit my monthly goal to make sure that I'm on track for ultimately my five year goal? So it sounds like you're you're a big planner, man. I try to, and now yeah. now I'm at that point. I need to start all over because yeah. I, I tell people ask me what now. I was like, well, I don't know. I haven't thought this far ahead. <laughs> you yeah. Know? So that's that's the next step is setting the the new goals for the next five years or ten years. Right. Right. So, so talk a little bit about um, you know a lot of folks want to accomplish what you've just done by replacing your job. I would say that probably is the single largest goal that people have when they're getting started in real estate is to replace their job, and it could be that they don't like it. It could be that they um, just want to know that they could leave if they wanted to, or they just don't want to have to be dependent upon somebody else and uh, want some of their time back and you know things like that. But very few people get out of the gate or get as far as you've gotten. So congratulations on that. That's awesome. Talk a little bit about what maybe other folks can do to help ensure their success. Um, I think and everybody that will tell you, everybody, to, you just need to do it. Um, and that's that's at every level, um, no matter what you're, you, you can read and learn and, and forever. Um, but you need to just take that step. Like I said, I, I wasn't, nothing was perfect to, to walk away from my job, but you just you just need to jump. You just yeah. need to take that step. Um, and once you do it, it's it's like anything. Everything looks scary when you don't know how to do it. But as soon as you do it, man, that was easy. I can do that again. Right. Um, and my, my angle getting into real estate was I wanted to learn and I wanted to learn all the different angles. And I heard a lot of people talking, like I said, I got into where I do primarily mobile homes. So I heard a lot of people talking that angle. And every time I heard it mentioned, I heard, I heard a little, they always mentioned tons of cash flow, you know, and I heard it here and I heard it there speakers all over. Um, so I was like, well, if I've heard that many people mention that, maybe I should, maybe I should look into that. Yeah. Um, one thing that I'd like to do is if everybody's running one direction, doing one thing, I just like to walk slowly the other direction and pick up all the money they left behind. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you got a hundred people looking to, to flip and sell retail, you know, okay, well, I'm the only guy, you know, doing mobile homes. So I looked at that. I can practice. The, the thing I liked is I can practice every aspect of my real estate on a smaller scale. Yeah. So, so it's not as scary to step in. And that's why I started there. Yeah. Um, very low capital to get in, but, but huge returns. My ROI on my mobile homes blows my stick homes out of the water. Yeah. You know, you're, you're smaller numbers in, but you're doubling and tripling your money versus making 20, 30, 40% on your money. I'm looking at 300 and 400% returns. Right. Right. Um, and, and that so you're, adds up. You're, and you're, and you're, what are you typically doing with, with mobile homes? I, I mainly rent and sell on owner finance. Okay. I have, you know, just because of the, the market and the niche that I'm in, I have very few where I just retail sell, sell them. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll buy them, you know, usually buy cash and then you sell on owner financing. I'll right. rehab them from top to bottom if they need them. And then I also do several that, that I have as rentals depending on, there's different areas with different rules, et cetera. Yeah. So, so talk a little bit about what a, what a typical, maybe share what a typical seller finance deal, what a typical deal looks like for you, um, what you're buying them for, what you're renting it for, or uh, seller, what, what, the, what the note looks like maybe. Okay. Um, my, my first deal was great, and that's one that, you know, when you're talking about being nervous, we were still in our class and learning and it was an online class so we met once a week and um my instructor would give us homework go look for this so we found one and we could put an offer in on we get it under contract for for three grand i think and we, we gave them 400 bucks so we the nice thing about mobiles is you have to be just like having a closing date you need to get approved by the park before you can do anything so it gives you a little leeway before you actually have to pay them yeah so so we're running around like crazy um, are we going to fix it? Are we going to rent it? We got contractors looking at, we got everything else. And a couple comes up and decides they want it. And they just say, Hey, will you take 7,500 cash? <laughs> so it's like, okay. So 
they they paid us we paid the seller and in a matter of six days we made thirty three hundred dollars yeah and it was before we even had our next our next class with our instructor next week so when he asked us you know well what 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 do you plan on doing with that deal that you got and we're, i'm like ah don't worry it's sold already we made a bunch of money we're ready so yeah. that so that started the business it got business cards you know got our bank account set up got our llc got attorneys um so that was a quick cash deal but i based off of that I always structured where I where I try to double my money. So in my area, I know you got a lot. If you're talking California or Florida or anywhere else, you know you've got some expensive mobile homes. But in my area, I've gotten I've gotten free mobile homes to twenty five hundred to four thousand is is pretty easy. I can yeah. get a, a three bedroom for four to five thousand, and then I can fix it up and easily owner finance it for for 10 to 12 or a nice three bedroom, two bath up in the mid teens, 16 to 18,000. So, um, for example, one right now, I just, just rehabbed a three bedroom, one bath and that was upgrading. I, I put in house cabinets, countertops, full size house tubs, all new wood laminate flooring, vinyl, paint, the whole thing, appliances, all that throughout. Um, you know, we're looking at about six grand, and I've just I've got to sold at fourteen five at three hundred dollars a month, so okay. I so I look to to double my money on the sale, double or more on the sale if I can, and then I also collect interest on my notes. So I'm looking anywhere a three to seven year note, depending on the the terms, the the principal of the loan, and then I take back interest on that loan as well for that whole term. So that adds to my profits. Yeah. So on the um, on the note. What what type of interest rates are you are you typically able to charge? Um, I have people that I like that are only getting seven eight percent. Um, I, I ran some at eleven, and then I started running. I run most of them at eighteen right now. Eighteen um, percent. Wow. What I found, I have stellar credit. Um, you know, great W two income, stellar credit. So I went in and just applied for a loan myself to to see where these were at, and being. If you're looking at new homes, you could get something better, but the bank considers these depreciating assets. Right. So they don't hold a lot of book value, and they're they're not really an asset to the bank. So when I went to a bank, even with my good credit and a down payment, they would only finance 60% of the property based off of their value, and the best rate I could get was 16%. Wow. From from my credit unit, and that and that was with a you know a 750, 770 credit score, something like that. So. Wow. Um, for, I, and anybody that asked me that on my terms, you know, I just explained to them that's, that's where I'm at with good credit and, you know, most likely, um, you know, you, they, they may don't have, they probably don't have 750 credit scores. Exactly. Yeah. They're not yeah. going to be in the same position to qualify. And then plus, you know, they don't have to deal with a bank. They just deal with me. So right. anytime you, anytime you own or finance or allow somebody to make payments to it, you're, you're adding additional value to the deal. Sure, and sure, and yeah. people will, and they should, they should pay more for that. Yeah. Um, that's great. You know, if I've got one for fourteen five, if if you want it for twelve, that's awesome. I I think it's worth twelve too if you pay it up front. You know, go ahead and go to the bank or, or bring cash. You know, I'm I'm on the same page. But yeah, if if you need to make payments for seven years, you know, it, you know, we got to bring the price up a little bit. That's that's how the right. business works. What what kind of uh, so if you're selling if you're selling a mobile home for let's just say fourteen fifteen thousand, what kind of down payment are you typically getting? Um, I get in that range, if I can get three or 4,000 and, and I have, um, that's what I shoot for that, that puts a little skin in the game. Yeah. Um, we like to get a, at least two grand. So, and then that all depends on which, which park I'm dealing with. Cause they'll have a security deposit and a, a first month's rent and stuff like that. Right, right. Um, but I feel comfortable if I can get two grand and usually they're willing to do a little more, you know, I've gotten payments up for $450. I don't do any payments less than two fifty, so that's that's another thing when you're looking at cash flow and you know talking about a goal or a, or a guideline, you need to set your minimum what what you're willing to take. Right. Um, and mine has always been I won't I won't take a payment less than two fifty. So if I'm looking at a deal, a, a rental or an owner finance deal, if I can't set it up to where two fifty coming back to me every month is a feasible payment, then it's not worth doing. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Well, so. On the goal setting stuff, let's go back to that. So, talk a little bit about did you um, 
how how organized are you that you have like a certain tool where you're putting this in or you just wrote it in a notebook or it's just in your head uh, for, yeah for for getting to my goals you would never think that i would because i'm not organized with them at all okay. and, and they may be written in a notebook somewhere from when when i heard you know t- heard somebody talking about setting goals um but I'll be the first to admit I, I'm not organized. It it surprises me what <laughs> if I actually accomplish anything sometimes because I have no idea how. Yeah. Um. But you you do need to write them down. I've for a long time. Um. In fact, I'll I'll probably do that now. Now that I'm telling you <laughs> and everybody else, um, having we're gonna, them. We're down, gonna hold you accountable. We're gonna hold you. Accountable. <laughs> I, I think the idea I've had and I I never did it was something on say for example your bedroom door a little marker board or a piece of paper there and just post it on the back of there because very few, if if they're in your bedroom, they're important enough, they can probably see what's on the back of your door. But you see it every morning when you get up and leave your bedroom then, you know, so that's something I've always thought, but it's, they've just been in my head. Um, And my thing is, like I said, I I tell people about them. That's how I keep track of them. Yeah. Um, And and it really holds you accountable because I just don't want to look like I backed out on all of them. So, I, right. When my friends and family ask me about what I'm doing or, or why I'm doing it or, like I said, my beard, for example, or, well, why are you growing a beard? You know, yeah. well, this is why. <laughs> so yeah. that, that's how I hold myself accountable. Yeah. So for folks that are looking to get started and try to achieve that job freedom, replace their job, what do you? What are the types of things you think about? Like, is it is it purely just cash flow? How do I – this is how much I make and how many houses – you know, or how many wholesales or whatever it might be that you're doing, do I need to get to to accomplish that? Is that? I mean, it's a bigger part than that because you have to start spending your time in addition to a full-time job building that up in the background. So talk a little bit about what, what folks need to consider when they're trying to essentially replace their job through real estate investing. Well, that's that's why your goals are so important. Whether That's such an open-end question and, and right, people right, ask right. that all the time is, you know, my goal was was a cash flow thing, but you may have, you know, you need to know and your your specific what's what's your agenda now. Do you have some debt you need to pay off? You know, do you have a trip you want to take? Do you have something nice you want to buy? Um, you know, where where are your expenses? Is what is that? And that determines that can also determine what aspect you're looking at is going into the business on on what you need. Um, so you need to figure out what you're trying to take care of first. Right. And for and for me, I was fortunate where I didn't, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of debt or even school debt or anything like that. Being in being in the army and stuff like that, um, and I had good income to cover my bills. So even though some other people I knew that started at the time, they they needed to make some cash and and make it quick and make chunks right. to uh, basically get out of a hole. I right from the start, my goal was was to build cash flow. So then I based my deals off of that. You know, I wasn't looking to. To be running around um, wholesaling, you know, running around tr- six hours a day trying to find properties because I still worked nine hours a day, right. and I needed something that I could do. I looked at what I could do as far as being as passive as I could, and that's when I looked at rentals and and notes. And even now that I have more time, um, people are approaching me about doing different things, and it's like I like real estate because I can make it passive because. Right. I can I can sit on a webinar at, at two o'clock in the afternoon and and not worry about it. Right, um, right. So that that was my that's what I chose and I right from the beginning I I went for that and I looked at what's going to give me cash flow and be be passive and, and be long term. Right, right. So and I know that you uh, because of uh, because I know Patty that you are a vice president of the uh, Trig Ria Club there. Um, and I preach a lot to folks the importance of RIA clubs with not just getting started, but building your business over the long haul and networking, things like that that are extremely critical. Um, talk a little bit about how being part of a RIA club helped you achieve your goals. I think that was a major part. Um, your your local RIAs are such a huge network. Like um, in the Virginia Beach area, Hampton Roads here, we have Trig. It's Tidewire Real Estate Investor Group. Um, as of last year, I'm the, the vice president. Patty was great. She was president for almost four years, mm-hmm. and I, I learned a lot from her. Um, but from day one, even back when I started, I took some class and, and had a mentor in the beginning. And 
one of the first things they did was find your local Rhea group, start rubbing elbows, start learning who's doing what. Um, there's so much you can learn there, and, and everybody's there. You have all your resources, uh, so you can learn. We do a lot. We're actually one of the one of the larger and one of the few that are nonprofit left. So we have about 250 members. We get 100 to 120 members at each meeting. Wow. So that's a that's a huge pool of uh, yeah. realtors and lawyers. You know, there's two or three lawyers there. If you have a, you can you can ask them a couple of questions. You know, how often do you get free legal advice? Well, right. <laughs> when you go to, to to a RIA meeting, maybe you can. Um, yep. So I put out. You know, if I have a problem, if if I I would say all the real movers and shakers, if they have a property. They, they have a resource of 250 people they can put it out to first. So the, the wholesalers are using it as a, as a buyer's list. You know, it's going out to them. Um, contractors are getting work from there. You know, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. If, if I need a, a referral for a contractor or electrician, something like that, yeah, I'm going to go to my, my RIA group first because you, we, we kind of vet people. And, and once they're part of the group, if, if you're not doing your job, people in that group are going to talk about it. Yeah. So, so if you're in a good RIA, um, you know, like I know we've we've had people that you know are no longer part of our RIA just because they're not ethical or or they don't play well with others or however you want to say it. So, yeah, you can find a lot of people out on your own, but a RIA group is such a huge pool of of good people right together, and and accountability. We have a meeting every month, so. You, you, have, you have some accountability. If Even if you're doing nothing else, you're going to take one night a month to go listen or, or learn about real estate. Yep. So I've been, I, I went to, uh, within my first two months of starting to learn risk, uh, real estate, I, I found the, the trig group and I started going. And in the, uh, the almost five years that I've went now, I've only missed one meeting. And that was wow. about... That was last August when I, I took a month off and went home. So in, in five years, I've only awesome. missed one, one meeting. So that's how strongly I feel about them. You know what's funny about RIA clubs and what, part of why I think the information is so good there is a lot of real estate investors are very siloed off from the world in their day job. They're, they're working independently. They're probably not talking to a lot of people. So it's like the one chance for you to go <laughs> and talk to at least like-minded people and you know, in my experience, most folks don't hold back. If they have good information to share, they're they're willing to share it. They're not. Well, I'm not going to tell you the good stuff now because, you know, in some instances, people view others as their competitors, and they may not give away you know trade secrets per se if they have any. If there are any in this industry, I don't know if there really are. Not <laughs> but, really. Uh, Somebody's teaching them somewhere. <laughs> it's a white whale, you know. Somebody it doesn't really exist, but everybody thinks it's it's a problem. But I think, um, in my experience, there are great opportunities to go talk to people that genuinely are happy to share that information and, and you know, also genuinely willing to find ways to work with people in unique ways. So, Yeah, that's um, – I run into very few people that, that try to keep secrets. And I've even presented at my group about mobile homes because, like I said, there's, there's not a lot of people that do it. Right. And, and some of the other, you know, seasoned investors are like, well, what are you going to hold back? What, what are you not telling everybody? Yeah. I said, I, I don't have, I'm not going to hold anything back. If I don't, I'm going to present what I think is the most important stuff. Yeah. And if, if people have questions, I'm going to answer it because, you know, 90, I don't know, 95% of your investors, they know that there's enough deals for everybody right. and it's, it's better to work together and you're going to make more money and be more successful that way than to try to keep everything to yourself and be top secret and you're going to push people away. People, if you're not willing to share and help, nobody's going to want to work with you either. So eventually right. you are going to be working by yourself. Right, right. And that's not a good way to go about it. Yeah. Well, Luke, so where do you, where do you go from here? That's a great question. <laughs> I'm, I'm still working on, um, on the, the cash flow scenario. Um, I'm working now on some more owner finances. I can do more of those. When I was working full time, I, you know, I was working nine hours a day in a non-air conditioned shop, you know, in on the East Coast. So I'm pretty, especially during the summer, I'm pretty wore out. Um, running, you know, anywhere from fifteen to twenty five or fifteen to twenty owner finance deals in town here, managing them all myself. And then about a year and a half ago, I actually purchased a mobile home park. Hmm. Um, so I'm looking at. I have I have manager and maintenance there, but when I took that on, that's that's like a whole another full time yeah. project. So 
I'm I'm really relieved now to have the time because at one point I felt like I was running three full time jobs. Yeah. Um. So so step one is um, do some more owner finances here in town. Um, I have even you know several investors that want more passive stuff. They're interested in, in partnering up on stuff like that. So I'm going to keep that going. Uh, but my long term goal, as far as what I need to start working on now, will build build in my park and uh, filling that back up because that's going to that's going to be the the long term rental income for me that I'm going to hold on to. Yeah, I'm okay with owner finance deals. Um, and the difference when you're looking at cash flow standpoint. If you want cash flow without the headaches of being a landlord, you need to sell an owner financing or, or sell rent to own because right. you still create the cash flow for those several years without any headaches of the property. Right. Um, and then you're running a, a percentage of which people are going to give it back to you anyway. You know, I'll, re- I'll do a owner finance for three, four years and then, you know, they just move out of town or going somewhere else and you end up with the property back for either they just give it back to you or you end up with it for very cheap and you get to do it all over again. So right. you have a lot of them that uh, they create rental income without the headaches. So yeah. that's that's one uh, avenue that I like. Yeah. The uh, I feel like you really do need to stagger and have some actual rental or some long-term stuff. That's My idea was that the owner finance is great for low management, but eventually they do get paid off. Yeah. So once again, looking at a passive standpoint, I really needed to, to hold a mix of rentals and owner finances. So when the owner finance were dropping off, the rental income would still make up for it. Hmm. So. Yeah, great. Well, I appreciate you sharing your story. It's, it's always great to hear success stories and what you've accomplished. There's so many other people that are looking to do that. Um, and I think, you know, you shared some great insights today that people can kind of use use what you've done as a roadmap. It's really just about setting goals and knowing what it is you're trying to accomplish and kind of setting some baby steps for how to get there. Yep. I agree. I appreciate it. And the more you point out how important the goals are, the more I realize that's what got me where I am. Let me say it a couple more times. Luke, yeah. You can just your, send me that. <laughs> eat your greens, Luke. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> awesome. Well, appreciate you being on the show and uh, we'll have a link below for folks to get to trig if they want to come meet you at an upcoming RIA in Virginia beach. Sounds great. I look forward to it. Thanks, Wish you all the best. Stay in touch, please. Will do. All right. Take care. Are you a member of FlipNerd.com, the most robust real estate investing platform in existence, where you can find off-market wholesale deals and great vendors literally in your market? You can get access to advice from experts and learn about local clubs and events right in your backyard. If not, please visit FlipNerd.com and register for a free account. You can register in less than a minute. It's pretty much the coolest site that's ever existed in the real estate investing industry, So get on over to flipnerd.com.